And the thing that was remarkable because most of them had in fact bought first class tickets. And somehow, because this was a luxury ship, the, the captain treated the, the passengers as if they were luxury passengers. And so, you know, there were marvelous, sumptuous meals, you know, and dances, and all kind of stuff. And I said, and I, I thought to myself, my God, here are these people, they barely escaped with their lives, they probably have all kind of relatives left behind, in concentration camps and whatnot. How can they all of a sudden go out and dance and stuff like that? Furthermore, what does a German crew think? Because from the point of view, Ger Germans, they were just filth, right? And so what are these filthy Jews doing, um, you know, behaving like uh, you know, plutocrats, going on vacation or something like that? But, you know, I suppose people were relieved to be away, and so it was really a luxury cruise, you know, it was amazing. And so we spent about two weeks on, on the crossing the Atlantic. So basically, you know, we start on this map. You have to look at the map. We start here in, Germ in Germany, right here. And go here, cross the English Channel, across the English Channel, and cross, cross the Atlantic Ocean to get to Cuba. That's the itinerary. Well, uh, when the day came near when we were supposed to land, we were in fact informed that we should get up early, you know. In fact, we, sh we should get up in four and five o'clock in the morning to get ready for disembarkation. We should have all our bags all packed. And so we all packed our bags and got up at four or five in the morning, ready to disembark. Well, but nothing happened. Somehow it became 12 and afternoon and Nobody was disembarking. So there was something wrong. We were told there was some, something, something had to be straightened out. And the next day or so it became clear that something seriously was wrong. Somehow the Cuban government did not acknowledge the legitimacy of the entrance permits which these we and others had purchased. And therefore didn't want to let us in. So here was a ship standing just outside the harbor in in Havana, with 900 refugees on t in it, and uh, all kind of negotiations were going on. I mean, there was a Jewish agency in New York was involved in negotiations, you know, with the Cuban government and whatnot, about what should happen to these refugees. After all, they had, in, bo in good faith, bought these entry permits, but the Cuban government said, no, they're not valid. Well. Uh, so at that point, the mood in the ship started getting rather bad. Some people were very desperate. There was one f person who slit his, his wrists and jumped into the water, and things of that kind. And in the meantime, there were little boats coming from Havana, near the boat, to kind of wave up to friends, you know. I told you there was a friend of mine who had gone to Cuba about two months earlier. He came in a little boat, and I could wave to him. He wave up to me, okay. But of course, we couldn't, we couldn't get out. We could not get off. And so the ship stayed there for about a, a week while negotiations were going on. But no, the ship couldn't stay there forever. And so basically, as told the, the ship had to lift anchor and, and depart. Well, at first the ship tried to essentially stay close to Cuba and close to the United States. There was, a, there was rumors going on, well, maybe some other country in, this v in the neighborhood might let us in. Maybe the United States would let us in, okay, after all. Uh, and the, the ship was going, in fact, passing close to the Florida border, the uh, shore. We could see the lights in Miami. But of course, the United States would not let us in. Nobody would let us in. And so it became clear if nobody would let us in, but the only choice left was for the ship, ship to go back to Germany which in fact we proceeded to do. Now I assure you the mood in the ship was completely different from the mood going to Cuba. Okay. So basically now the, the great food had disappeared, the mood in the ship was extremely somber, people were very depressed. Uh, some people tried to commit suicide, stuff like that. Because basically, well, you know, the ship was going east and going back to Germany. 
And not only this, I was thinking, and I think I'm sure other people are thinking, well, well, suppose you go back to Germany, what's left there? Well, you've abandoned your apartment, you have, you have nothing left there. There's no place to go back to, right? Even if you, some, you know, so what's going to happen to you? Well, quite obviously, the only thing that would happen to you is somebody might, they might throw you in a concentration camp because there's el nowhere else to go. So the moving ship was extremely desperate, and so the ship continued on its east voyage. And then, just about the last moment, about two days before it was due to arrive in Germany, there arrived a telegram saying that as a result of various negotiations, four countries in Europe had agreed to divide the refugees among themselves. That's because of a tremendous relief. It said that, you know, we would not have to go back to Germany, we would somehow get divided among four countries. And the four countries which had so agreed to do that were, yeah, there were England, which is somewhere up there, Netherlands, Holland if you want, Belgium, and France. And so as a result of that, the ship, instead of going back to Germany, went back and docked at Antwerp in, in Belgium, somewhere here. And then people came aboard and somehow started dividing the refugees up so that somehow to decide who would go where. As far as I know, this was largely a random process. And so as a result of this random process, it was decided that we, which I mean my mother, sister, and myself, were going to go to France. Well, uh, and so as a result of, of this, the uh, people were left, let off, uh, we were going to France, uh, so they, the, Ger the German uh, line, the shipping line, provided a freighter to essentially take these refugees from Belgium to France. It was a freighter, and so they had kind of double deck of bunks we could sleep in for a day or two. And after that, uh, the ship left and with about 250 or so odd people uh, uh, to, go to go to France and arrive in Boulogne, northern part of France. So this is basically the end of the major voyage. Gustav Schroeder was the captain of the fateful voyage of the St. Louis, which left Hamburg, Germany, heading for Cuba. He had been forced to accept six Gestapo agents as crew members aboard the St. Louis, and he was constantly pressured to join the Nazi party. Prior to the trip to Cuba, an official from Hamburg, America, came aboard the St. Louis and warned Captain Schroeder that if he did not join the Nazi party, his job as captain was in jeopardy. Captain Schroeder ordered the man off his ship. Frustrated and angered by the Nazis' interference, Captain Schroeder considered quitting his job. That is, until he learned that his next voyage would be the Jewish refugees. At that point, he knew he could not resign. He gathered his crew together, and contrary to the Nazi ideology told them, you will all never forget for a moment that these passengers are to be treated no differently from any others we have carried. Captain Schroeder's attempt at making the Jews feel welcome upon the St. Louis was constantly being sabotaged. On the first night of the voyage, the after-dinner movie was supposed to be a romantic story. Second-class steward Otto Scheindick switched the movie. The Jewish refugees were appalled when Adolf Hitler appeared on the screen shouting anti-Jewish sentiments and was followed by a narrator stating that the day of reckoning for the Jews was at hand. For the most part, Captain Schroeder was successful in making the voyage to Cuba pleasant. Grateful to be leaving Nazi oppression behind them and anxious to arrive in safe harbor, the passengers spent the journey to Cuba enjoying good food, dancing, and swimming in the ship's pool. On May 23rd, Captain Schroeder received a cable stating that because of New Cuban Law 937, the majority of passengers may not be given permission to disembark. The captain informed several of the refugees and suggested they form a committee of passengers. 
Dr. Max Weiss asked what the captain would do if upon reaching Havana they could not disembark. The captain answered saying, I give you my word that I will do everything possible to avoid going back to Germany. I am only too well aware of what they would do to you. On June 1, 1939, Captain Schroeder was told that the St. Louis must leave Cuban waters. Furthermore, he was told that the Cuban Navy would force the ship to leave if it did not on its own accord. On June 6th, the St. Louis turned and headed towards Germany. Captain Schroeder knew that if the refugees arrived in Germany, they would most likely be sent to concentration camps. If no other solution could be found, he planned to crash the ship near the English coast, thus forcing the British authorities to take action. During the Holocaust, many people found they had a choice to make. Would they be a perpetrator, a bystander, or a rescuer? Captain Schroeder was a rare individual, a man willing to go against popular opinion, risking his job to do what he knew in his heart was right. At one time or another, we all find ourselves in a position where we too have a choice to make. There may be a time when you will witness anti-Semitism, bullying, racism, or a friend who has been drinking alcohol and is about to drive. The example set by Captain Gustav Schroeder teaches us to be more thoughtful when we have to make major decisions. When Fred arrived in France in June 1939, he was slightly more than 12 years old. An uneasy peace prevailed in Europe. However, in September 1939, Hitler invaded Poland, thus precipitating the beginning of World War II. For almost a year, the Western Front remained quiet. But in May 1940, Hitler invaded Belgium, Holland, and France. After only six weeks, in June 1939, all these countries were defeated and the fighting ended. Here Fred tells about his life in France, how he was overrun by the German armies, and how he managed once again to escape from the Nazi clutches. So here we were all now in Boulogne, not knowing any French language, uh, and here we were awaiting our fate. Now, there was one interesting provision, incidentally, in this agreement to divide the refugees among the countries. Namely, the agreement was that the refugees could not work, were not allowed to work. And the reason was that, remember, these were depression times and unemployment was severe in most countries, and they didn't want other people to take w work away from their own citizens. So that meant that we had to rely on the, on the uh, uh, charity of Jewish organizations in New York and not to support us. And they, in fact, decided what should be done with these refugees. So in the case of those of us who had gone to France, they decided they were going to divide up these refugees into very small groups and scatter them all over the country. And so it happened that we, again when I say we, I mean my sister, mother, and myself, were sent to a small place in France, in the middle of France, central France, a small town of about 5,000 people called Luda, and we actually accommodated in a hotel in that, in that, in that town, and it, in some sense it was a fair accommodation. We got fed and we had a, a room to us, to ourselves, and so that wasn't really bad. And there we were, just waiting, you know, what else could one do? Now, a couple months later, this was in May, in September, war broke out. What happened is that in September of, of 39, Germany invaded Poland. When Germany invaded Poland, England and France des decided, they gave an ultimatum to withdraw, otherwise they were going to go to war. And so they, in fact, went to war. So at, at the beginning of September 39, France, England, as well as England, were at war with Germany. Now at first, there's very little noticeable things going on as far as we were concerned. The war proceeded in, in Poland with very rapid 
annihilation of the Polish forces and very rapid advances by the Germans. But as far as the Western Front was concerned, in terms of France and England, things were quiet. Right? And so what I did was I spent my time mostly trying to learn French. That was my main goal. And uh, it was a cold winter, but there was a nice public school in, in that little town had a courtyard with about, I think, seven or eight doors on it. And every door corresponded to a different class from a different level. First grade, second, third, fourth, fifth, and so on and so forth. And uh, I was the only student who was no foreigner or whatnot. And the director of the school, who taught the, the highest grade, took me under his wing and put me in his highest class and was very kind to me. And so while other people were students were trying to study and do various things, and he kept them busy, he would sit with me in the back of the room quite often, trying to teach me French, individual lessons. And so I spent a few, few months that way improving my knowledge of French, and then by the middle of the year I got good enough so I could begin to participate in the class, although the first attempts to participate were a little bit disastrous. I always remember the uh, uh, first task I had to do was to take dictation somebody dictates something in French and you have to write it down. Well, if you don't understand the words, you know, it's very hard to take dictation. <laughs> but, you know, I improved. And so before, by the end of the, by the, end of the uh, academic year, I could compete with the best of them. Well, so this brings us to May, we now in May of 1940. When we, lo and behold, we received a notice from the American consulate in Paris that our quota number for visa to the United States was about to come up and that we should come to Paris to essentially the consulate so one could discuss the, issue, the situation and they might be able to issue us a visa. And so off we traveled to Paris to go to the consulate. Well, it was strange because the very first night we were there, there were air raid alarms. In the next few days, there were nothing but air raid alarms. We were rushing to air raid shelters and whatnot. We didn't know what was going on. It turned out later that precisely the time that we had gone to Paris, the Germans had decided to invade Belgium and Holland. And as they were doing that, they were sending some planes over Paris just to have some fun. So that's the reason for the air raid alarms, OK? Well, we went to the American consulate and they said, yes, yes, your number is coming up. So, in fact, by next, by next month, we should be able to give you some visas. So come back next month and we'll give you the visas. Well, you know, next month never arrived. Because by next month, France had fallen into German hands. Anyhow, we did go back to our little town. And now it became very visible that the war was going on. In fact, what happened is, you know, as the Germans invaded, the Germans invaded this way. They came from Netherlands and Belgium and down south. And they proceeded very, very rapidly. And the French troops and, and all the others were just crumbling in front of them. There were hordes and hordes of refugees. I don't mean Jewish refugees. I mean one and people who would, who would flee in advance of the advancing armies. And so they would essentially come down this way, and they'd come down by, by cars, by bicycles, on foot, any way you want. And sooner or later, they of, often would get stuck. You know, they ran out of gasoline and stuff like that. And so even our little town, you know, there were a whole colony of cars all stuck with refugees who had come from the north. And so all we could do is kind of wait and see what's going to happen as reading newspapers how the Germans were advancing. And lo and behold, one day, there were German troops in our town. Uh, so we, ha we had been overrun also by the German army. We were staying in this hotel, and quite a few German officers were also staying in the hotel. Sometimes we eat ad adjacent tables. And we didn't want to give away the fact that we were German, a new German. And we had to kind of instill in my sister the fact Please do not speak German. She was, after all, a young kid. And boy, she came awfully close sometimes, because I remember once a soldier gave her a piece of chocolate, and she, being very polite, almost said, Danke schön. <laughs> German, thank you, okay?
these soldiers were, were marching around every day shooting into the air and my brother and my mother and I would sit on the windowsill in this hotel looking out and there was this one young soldier and I remember, I remember his shape but I don't remember his face and um, he threw me candy every time they were marching around he would throw candy up to me and my mother didn't want me to eat it because she was absolutely convinced it was poison but of course I hadn't seen candy for a long time so I ate it and here I am um, and then the last day before we left on that midnight train um, he threw me a little sailor doll which I still have did that guy know or have any idea that I was Jewish and in the early years I somehow used to think that maybe he did and now I think you know he probably he wouldn't have